Testament, and we will look over in 2 Peter. The sermon this morning and this afternoon will have to do with the study of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We shall do what is called an exegetical study of this passage, which means to exegete is to lead out of the passage. Only what God put in it for us to learn. To exegete it is to read into it what's not there. And a lot of people do that. It's a danger to every one of us. And what we're going to study in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4 is the nature of God's promises. The nature of God's promises. And I hope this will better help us to grasp those promises by understanding the nature of them. Peter writes, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter, According as his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now regarding the text, the Apostle Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, says that God has called us. Well, who would the us be? It would have to do with members of the church of our Lord, Christians, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ. Verse 1 of this chapter. And in this reading, God has called us by his own glory and virtue. Well, that is by means. That is, he called us by means of his glory and virtue. These great, these exceeding great and precious promises are given. And it's for the express purpose to do something for you and for me and for all faithful children of God. And when we talk about this morning in the class in the back building about the eternal reward in the resurrected body likened to Christ as John describes it, we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him. We're able to see that we should concentrate on the fact that we'll be a partaker of the divine nature. We have a human nature now. But the, these exceedingly great and precious promises, he's preparing us to have a divine nature. Peter is thus directing special attention to the promises of God. Now, let me emphasize again. God's promises are great and they're precious to you. And you think of something that's great in this life to you and very precious to you. <laughs> well, whatever it might be, these promises of God excel those things in their greatness and how precious they are. Now, this is Peter's own inspired description of them. Remember, they have been made possible because of God's glory and virtue. Let's look at uh, the word great. I doubt Jody knew this, but she has in the snow cone stand a mega cup. I think you know what mega is. It's found its way into our language. But great is the Greek word megas. It's used in Luke one thirty-two, 
in speaking of the Christ. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Then in Hebrews 10 and verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, the greatness of the high priest, even under the Mosaical system, but especially Christ eclipsing that typology. The word precious here is the Greek timios, and it's used in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 12 as precious stone. In 1 Peter 1, 19, the precious blood of Christ. Well, of course, Paul emphasizes that the Christ is the mediator of a better covenant, if so be Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, which hath been enacted upon better promises, Hebrews 8 and verse 6 force of that is to the Jewish Christian as he's being tempted to leave off the New Testament system and go back under the law and saying you're going under an inferior product. You're going under an inferior law. That law pointed to a greater law. Now you're giving it up to go back to an inferior one. But the promises of the New Testament are better promises than the promises of the old. So God's promises are important, to say the least. We remember from the very beginning of the Bible that man is made in the likeness and the image, if you please, of God. That doesn't mean his flesh is made in the likeness and image of God. It means, as the writer of Hebrews said, the very spirit is fathered by God and thus reflects the divine genetics, if you want to call it that, of God. Man, being a free moral agent, of course, transgressed God's law, and that's what sin is, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And thus, he corrupted that image. And as you go down through the Bible, you see the great and marvelous scheme of redemption unfold before us down through the ages. And it's designed to recreate man in God's image. We would do well to realize as we labor to know the New Testament and honestly comply with it, we're trying to recreate that image that was there in man before he sinned. Why? To enable man to be a partaker of the divine nature. It's promised to those who faithfully serve God in his church. Peter stresses that these precious promises then enable one to become a partaker of a divine nature. That points up even further why they're exceeding great and precious promises. Now we can pause here and remind ourselves that God never goes back on his promises. He always keeps his promises. And thus, that should reassure every one of us as we labor to live as the New Testament teaches that God will keep his promises. God's promises are certain then of fulfillment. And the scriptures are full of material like this. We won't try to call all of them. I think of Hebrews 10, 23. I think of Romans 4, 21, 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9, uh, pertaining to all sorts of things. Go back to the Old Testament, Genesis 12, promises made to Abraham, or the promise made earlier on than that, a very vague picture of the salvation of man in Genesis 3 and verse 15. But all of these God keeps. Now, I've known a lot of folks, I think they cared a lot for me, and I think at times... Uh, they never had any idea of breaking their promises, but due to human frailties, sometimes their promises weren't kept. Well, recognizing that we're all like that, having human frailties, then we don't expect such things to always be that way. And thus, we preface a lot of promises we make, maybe by saying that the Lord will. But that's not so with God. When he makes a promise, it will be fulfilled. 
So the scripture illustrates those things besides being full of the actual promises on various matters. I said again, or I say again, there's the vague picture of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15. And of course, thousands of years later, Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God kept his promise. God promised Abraham a son. I've already mentioned Genesis 12, 1 through 3. 25 years later, Isaac was born. The God is not controlled by time. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. But he keeps his promises. God promised Abraham's descendants a land, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And 470 long years later, he kept his promise. God promised the total destruction of the Amalekites, Exodus 17, 14. 400 years later, he commanded King Saul to destroy them. God's promises are sometimes unconditional. I say unconditional. You'll remember that God promised the Redeemer in Genesis 3.15. Then also he promised the world that he never would destroy the world again by water. Genesis 9 and verse 11. He promised to take Abraham's descendants out of Egyptian bondage. Genesis 15.1.6. Years later, he performed the promise. And the kingdom of Christ is promised by Daniel over in the land of Babylon, interpreting a dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 and verse 44, that the God of heaven would, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. And he did that. Mark 9, 1, Acts chapter 2. Now we're... 2,000 years removed from the beginning of that kingdom, Acts 2. The authority of Christ is manifest completely in the New Testament concerning all the promises of God for all those who love him and keep his commandments. When it comes to the divine nature, because he writes this to Christians. But we also know he's promised the Lord will come again, Acts 1.11. And then we know 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Do you who are troubled? Rest with us. The Lord Jesus be revealed with the mighty angels in the flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those things are unconditional promises. They're going to happen. But sometimes God's promises are conditional. God promised that he would spare the firstborn down there in Egypt, if the blood was sprinkled appropriately, Exodus 12, 13. But what if it's not sprinkled appropriately from the right animal? He's not obligated to keep his promise. He promised healing to those who would look upon the serpent of brass after they had sinned in Numbers 21, 29. <coughs> But what if they didn't look upon the serpent of brass? He's not obligated to keep his promises. As Joshua entered the land of Canaan, Jericho, the first city, would fall. It was a conditional promise. When the people had done as they were instructed to do, Joshua 3, 6, verses 3 through 5. But what if they hadn't done as God instructed them to do? That is, if they hadn't been faithful to God if they had not been obedient. When it comes to studying about the cleansing of Naaman from his leprosy in 2 Kings 5, he was told you'll dip seven times in the River Jordan. After you come up that seventh, seventh time, your leprosy will be cleansed. That was a promise, but it was a conditional promise. But what if he had dipped seven times? And his disposition at first was not to dip any. He just had his mind made up the way things ought to be. But he had reasonable people with him 
And they said, if he had beat you, do some great thing from the standpoint of what man considers great, wouldn't you have done it? Well, he acquiesced. And he went to the old muddy river Jordan, dipped seven times. His flesh came to him as a little child, Second Kings 5. But if he hadn't, he would have remained a leper. Sight was granted to the blind and a miracle done by Jesus Christ. A certain man was blind and he was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam. John chapter 9. But what if he hadn't gone and washed? Sometimes the Lord just heals somebody. Sometimes it's his wisdom that determines that. He would require action on the part of the person. When God promises a conditional blessing, it is never bestowed until the condition is met. And thus we remind ourselves of what's taught us about the worth of the Old Testament examples. Whatsoever things were written for our learning, or written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Well, the same is true under the New Testament system. There are promises he's going to keep, such as the return of Christ, regardless of what man does or doesn't do. But there are other promises he's not going to keep. He's not going to forgive anybody of their sins, though he would have all men be saved, and Christ died for all men. If those people will not receive with meekness the engrafted word, which teaches the conditions of salvation that they must meet. Now, in this study, we sought to direct attention to the nature of God's promises. We haven't brought out too much. We'll bring some more out this afternoon. But you see, then, there are promises, great and precious promises. And they're designed to form in us the divine nature. Now, that will not be brought to fruition until the resurrection morn, when we're raised in that glorified body. At present, Christ is human, but he's a glorified human. That's why John can say, we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him as a glorified human. Paul gives a little description of the resurrected body. This body is sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. That doesn't do my mind a whole lot of good in detail. But what if he decided, God that is, to go into a great deal of detail? Who would I have understood it? I can talk about the glories of heaven, but I'm still wedded to living in the reality of the flesh. Thus we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And these promises are God's promises for our good, and he will keep them. In the case of becoming a Christian, he will keep his promise to forgive our sins if we will receive the truth and believe it. Repent of our sins, confess our faith in Christ, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Any doctrine that sets itself or raises itself against the plan of salvation is a false doctrine and did not come from heaven. As a child of God, if you sin, the second law of pardon is to repent of sin and confess sins and pray God for forgiveness. I can be sorry for my sins as a member of the church. I'm one willing to repent, confess those sins, God's not going to forgive me. So his promises are great and precious. How important they are. And they're certain of fulfillment. Sometimes unconditional, sometimes conditional. And in closing, I just simply say, may God help us to respect his exceeding great and precious promises.
as we ought to and really as we must if we're to become a Christian and be faithful to him. If you need to obey the gospel this morning, will you think of all the things that God has done to save us from our sins that we can never do for ourselves? And it's such a little thing for us to humble ourselves and obey the truth of the living God, thus demonstrating our faith in God and His exceeding great and precious promises. If you're then subject to the will of Christ, the invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.